Hey there. Hello. Hope you're all doing great. Recently, I've had something on my mind. I'm not going to beat around the bush. It's Green Lantern. I've been thinking a lot about Green Lantern. Now, why is that, you ask? Well, since making all these videos, pitching movie ideas, and talking about epic sci-fi directors, it got me thinking, how have we not got a good Green Lantern movie yet? Here we go. Oh my God! How, and more importantly, why is it so hard to make a Green Lantern movie? The answer is, it's not. Look at First Flight. But why have studios failed to bring Green Lantern to the big screen? Well, that's what I want to look at today. To decipher why the 2011 movie crashed and burned the way it did, and the amazing potential of this character, this series of characters. So join me as we take a look at Green Lantern. Green Lantern and many other DC heroes introduced in the Silver Age were a response to an explosive interest in science fiction during the 50s, the day the Earth stood still, War of the Worlds, invasion of the Body Snatchers and Creature of the Black Lagoon. Characters then like the revamped Green Lantern and Flash, the Martian Manhunter and Aquaman made big splashes in comics, giving life to superhero comics again, which had fizzled out after World War II. Green Lantern specifically was reinvented from his Earthbound roots, completely overhauled to a spacefaring hero with a redesigned costume and origin story. I'm sure you guys know the rest. Test fight pilot, Avin Sir, gets a ring, bada bing, bada boom, and you've got a superhero. You are now a Green Lantern, one of the protectors of the universe. The original appeal of Green Lantern was that connection to the sci-fi, other worlds, and alien life. The book was a hit. In later renditions of the character, that sentiment was expanded upon with Jeff Johns, providing significant world-building to the Lantern Corps, adding nuance to the Green Lantern's weakness to Yellow, spinning it into one of fear. It's a whole parallax thing, it's really not worth getting into explaining now. What's important is what Jeff Johns was able to do was to take a character and give him a Star Wars level treatment with the Sinestro Core War, Blackest Night, and so forth. That Green Lantern had the potential to be a sci-fi epic, something operatic and grand. It appears, however, that this scale, this potential, had been forgotten about when making 2011's Green Lantern. For some reason, following the trend of taking a space-faring galactic hero and sticking them in a desert. But what the f- what, what is- <sighs> never mind. The general consensus on 2011's Green Lantern is that it's bad. Really bad. Like, not even fun bad. Just bad, you know? It's seen as a dog shit abomination, and honestly, I think that's an overblown reaction to what is essentially just a really forgettable movie. If it hadn't been a punching bag to every joke in the last 10 years, I think people would have forgotten about it way sooner. Look, the movie is kind of strange. It gives off the same energy as an unenthusiastic handjob. I know, right? Wait, is that Taika Waititi? Anyway, the villains that are in the movie is just a bunch of big heads. A big cloud head, a big forehead head, and a big head head. Speaking of Hector Hammond, he feels like such an afterthought. Just as the movie is picking up a pace with what's happening with Hal, it cuts back to show his slow shenanigans, making the movie feel way longer than it is. Parallax is pretty much Galactus from Rise of the Silver Surfer, just attached a scrotum head to it. Honestly, it's formless and doesn't feel nearly as threatening as the actual Parallax entity from the comics. Overall, the movie is just a shitty version of Iron Man, a story about adopting responsibility, a story that was meant to kick off a universe, and that's where the similarities end, lacking the defined character arc that made Tony Stark so compelling, lacking the character work to make this scene feel like it has any impact. What are you talking about? These are empty words to you. This oath means nothing to you yet. All right, time to recompose myself. Take a breather, Mitch. Okay. What disappoints me most is the clear lack of vision on behalf of the storytellers, a movie that played it safe, that took a space-centric hero and kept him on Earth. Like the Fantastic Four, part of the fun of Green Lantern is exploring new worlds, meeting new friends or foes, adding layers to their understanding of the universe, whether that be Reed's scientific discoveries or Hal's understanding of the other Lantern cores, there's an ever-present sense of wonder, discovery and excitement that space offers. That's not felt here. Sure, these movies were a byproduct of the early 2000s, an era of superhero movies that played it safe comparatively to now, but still that doesn't excuse their fundamental misunderstanding of the source material. 
of the characters. The Hal Jordan we got in the movie was disappointing. I know, right? Mitch, you can't use that twice in one. In the comics, Hal Jordan is a maverick, bold and brash. He's the type of guy to leap before he knows where he's landing. In brightest day and blackest night, no evil shall escape my sight. Let those who worship evil's might be where my power, Green Lantern, light! He's got balls of steel, an unparalleled will. He's courageous and lives life with a disregard for risk if he knows it's the right thing to do. A man with no time for red tape. This mindset served him well as a test pilot and his adventures as a Green Lantern, although that has also made him abrasive to accept defeat. A man willing to keep fighting long after everyone else has quit. A man that doesn't have much respect for authority if it doesn't align with what's right. Which is likely why he butts heads with the Guardians. Whilst cocky and charming when it comes down to it, he's a serious force to be reckoned with. The man is Will personified. Hal has a forceful and strong personality that makes him a good leader and decision maker especially in the heat of battle. The other lanterns are willing to follow him because he leads by example, puts himself in danger first. He feels guilt for his losses, not willing to ask something of someone if he's not willing to first do it himself. However, the broad strokes of this were in the movie, the movie adapting some scenes from the comic. So what's the issue? Well, I'm more concerned about the finer minutia of the character. Hal is a very different character compared to his introduction during the Silver Age. A mutable character of sorts, he is ever developing and changing, learning to be better, to be present. Sure, it is true that he can be unstable, self-sabotaging in his relationships, and mask his self-hate with a cocky facade, all whilst being completely confident in his ability as a hero. Hal is his own worst enemy, and it's his perseverance, his weaknesses, and most importantly his fears, that make this character appeal to me. Hal is my favourite Green Lantern, whilst John is the one I grew up with, Guy is always a good laugh, and Kyle has a lot of unique experiences, for me Hal represents everything great about what a Green Lantern can be. Whilst Hal has been compared to Han Solo, I don't think that's a particularly accurate reading of the characters, whilst they share a similar cocky attitude, that's about it. Han Solo's character is about showing he is more than his own self-interest and selfishness, to fight for something bigger than himself, which he does. Hal, on the other hand, was never self-interested to begin with. Whilst cocky, he always remained selfless, doing shocking or bold things if it was the right thing to do regardless of the risk, and I think that highlights the key differences between the movie and the comics. Hal in the film has such little redeeming qualities before he gets the ring, really pushing the charming angle to the point of being a sleazebag. Once he does get the ring, he becomes a yes man to any and all exposition and instruction given to him by the aliens in the film. He seems overwhelmed. That to me doesn't sound very hell, culminating in an arc that was never set up, payoff to a story that feels hollow and without direction. The most egregious thing about the film isn't Hector's constant screaming. Wait for it, he's not done. Jesus, man. It's not even that it takes a space-centric hero and sticks him on Earth for 90% of the movie, although that is really bad. It's that it doesn't do anything to hit at the core of what Green Lantern is about beyond the surface level understanding of overcoming fear. That to be a Green Lantern, it's not about having fear, but being able to overcome it, which is all very surface level Green Lantern stuff. It doesn't go deeper with that at all. Much like Superman being the best of us, how through overcoming fear makes him something worthy of aspiring towards as well showing us that we don't need to be docile and complicit with the world that we live in, a world run by fear. A theme like this was missing from the movie. To not just show that Hal is overcoming fear, but that he can inspire by overcoming fear. To be a hero. The actual point, the core thesis if you will, as to what the Green Lantern story is, is well, one about being emotionally literate. Regulating and being in control of your rage, or fear, or greed. How being emotionally illiterate can cause a great deal of pain. The effects of love gone too far can be possessive and cruel, one's rage or even greed consuming the self, fear paralyzing the mind to a specific worldview, trapping you in a paranoia of events outside of your control. It is Hal's temptations and combatant against other aspects of the emotional spectrum that makes him great, to give us a character with a deep understanding of himself, his emotions and what he is capable of. Hal's extremely compelling, his mentor Sinestro is equally compelling, similar to Hal in many ways. Both are defiant and free thinking in a way that they both disagree with the Guardians, an attribute Sinestro kind of respects in Hal. Sinestro wants a universe of order. Much like the authoritarian rule he has over his homeworld of Korrigar, 
He believes in the core because it's a police force that enforces order in the galaxy. The line that he crosses is when he uses fear to get that order. The only way to operate out here is by fear. They hit, I hit harder. They attack, I annihilate. I am the one constant unassailable force against their chaos, and you made them forget that! Sinestro can be punishing, cruel, but usually right. He has a point, as inconvenient as it is to hear. He can foresee what the core will become, that the Guardian's weakness and hubris will force them to alter their values to create a more militant police-like core, cops abusing their power. His point proven as the Book of Oa is given an amendment, the ability to use lethal force. The world of Green Lantern is a massive sprawling epic, a tale of fear, of love, of strength of will, all tied together with a ticking bomb prophecy for pretty much every character involved, centering around an essential weakness for the Green Lanterns. Fear. For Abin Sur, he knows his death will come when his ring fails him when he needs it most. Succumbing to fear, it causes that death. For the Guardians, they fear the blackest night, the end of all things, that the death of all begins on Earth. That's why they were so hesitant to enroll Hal Jordan as a Lantern. So fearful of a prophecy that they inadvertently then allowed it to come to pass. For Sinestra, it's a fear of Korrigar erupting into chaos, going against that essential value of order. This fear motivating him down a path of increasingly tighter order. So when the power of will wasn't enough, he decided to weaponize that fear as an authoritarian dictator. As you can tell, these characters draw their strength from will, but it's their constant battles with fear, with prophecy, that decided their fate. If their will was strong enough, if they can admit their fears, or if they will fall to them. That being said, these elements are nowhere in the movie. No intense ideological battle, no confrontation of ideas. Rough night, huh? Hector. The closest we get to that is Hal coming to Oa to ask for help, them being like, nah, you're on your own, pal, only for him to be like, maybe hold off on the fear thing just yet, I'll show you that Will can still work. This scene is just dull, it's not compelling, and doesn't establish the themes of fear in a poignant way that they matter beyond the surface level of, I can overcome great fear. Look, there's a lot wrong with this movie, repeating exposition being a big no-no for starters. The strongest source of energy in the universe. Harness the most powerful force in existence. What's with all the green? Green is the color of will. The emerald energy of willpower. Welcome to Oa, the planet Oa. The Green Lantern Corps has served as the keepers of peace. And the intergalactic peacekeepers known as the Green... Yeah. Yeah, that part I heard about. The audience should be finding everything out along with how. We shouldn't be ahead of the character. If the expositional prologue was removed, suddenly every Green Lantern related scene leading up to this moment would have been far more interesting and compelling. You'd be asking questions like, who's that? You'd be pulled into the movie. The answer's coming then when Tomar Ray gives us that exposition. But by then, we've been searching for those answers, so now that exposition would feel cathartic. Spoon feeding us a crash course in the opening scene was this movie's biggest mistake. It makes every scene after it feel flat. Another thing with Green Lantern is his character arc. Look, there's kind of one there. Kind of. Hal does the whole refusal of the call thing and says fuck being a Green Lantern, but when you cross the threshold from the ordinary world into the special world, you don't then return back to that ordinary world. Green Lantern, instead of pumping the brakes and returning back to Earth, should have continuously dived deeper into the world of the Lanterns, dived deeper into the prophecies the characters fear, their anxieties coming true. Expand on the theme of fear, a ticking bomb of tension. Our meeting was destiny. No, Abin. It was luck. All of this, everything we do, is a part of that destiny. We will agree to disagree. Sinestro should have been a larger character, showing how the cosmos take him on a journey, showing us his worldview and his history with Abin Sur, how he was a friend to him. With the Guardians, their reluctancy to believe in a human could spawn from the Blackest Night prophecy, that they don't want to touch Earth, feeling as though it'll begin the events that lead to Blackest Night. As we know, Green Lantern stories are at their best when we're in space, have this be a space epic on the scale and world building of something like Star Wars. Also, remove the Sinestro end credit scene if you're not going to earn that character properly. You can't reduce his entire character arc into a couple of cheap lines before the man chucks on a ring. If you're going to do Sinestro, do him right. We need to live with this character, see a man torn up by his mission through the eyes of a man experiencing the universe for the first time. See him slowly get more agitated with the bureaucracy of the Guardians the disgust and distaste he has for a universe without order, to have him establish a dream for the core, 
and when that dream is shut down, to establish his own core. Have this scene feel earned, not have Sinestro pop in every now and then and then stick on a ring. Warner Brothers, do better. The Green Lantern comics are an examination on the importance of emotion and that all are needed to live a complete and full life. Comparatively, this movie's scale and intimacy is so far removed from what it could be. The drama could have been so much richer, the theme so much more poignant with a movie that dared to be more than what we got. Green Lantern will be remembered as just an eh movie. The equivalent of pissing in a toilet bowl, but you miss and just say fuck it and I can't be asked cleaning up. Look, it's not all bad, there's a couple things going for it. The score is pretty decent and it has a pretty steady pace and Mark Strong is the perfect Sinestro, just sadly underutilized. Now I will be making a follow up to this video, a how to make Green Lantern good if you will. So I'll go into more depth there, but for now, if I were to do a Green Lantern movie or a series of films, a trilogy perhaps, I'd definitely pull from Jeff Johns. His work on the character was seriously groundbreaking. I'd make a movie with an adversary that hits at the core of what Green Lantern is about, emotions. But I'll continue that in the next video. I want to know what you guys think. Did you hate 2011's Green Lantern or were you just mildly disappointed? How would you approach a Green Lantern reboot? What Green Lantern characters would you want to see? Not you, Arisha. Sound off below and I'll see you guys in the next video. Ciao.